Well, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Revelation chapter 2. Hallelujah. We're living in these days. We're living at the end of the church age. And we're learning about the book of Revelation. We're learning about the times we're living in. But while we're learning about the times that we're living in, what's happening, though, is there is being a re- there, the Lord Jesus Christ is being revealed to our hearts. This book is the revealing of Jesus Christ. As we've said, we spent four weeks laying a foundation that now we're going to go to this next phase. We're going to talk, we're going to get into this. Tonight we're going to start Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, and we're going to talk about the letter to the church at Ephesus. There are seven, the Lord Jesus had John write letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. There were 500 to a, we estimate 500 minimum, probably closer to 1,000 churches in Asia Minor. And, and God, told, God chose seven of them. And I'm telling you, what we see in these seven letters, it's as if it was written for the church today. So, so we need to really see some things, and the Lord's just going to reveal himself. Now remember, the revelation of Jesus Christ that you get all throughout the book of Revelation is he is greater than anything that you'll ever face. That he is the triumphant Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is almighty God. He's bigger than anything that you'll ever face. So in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now what's interesting is in this first letter, he's talking about some same things that he talked about in chapter 1. Now, we're not going to go back and do a big review, but this is interesting. The first time that Jesus, the risen Lord, he is revealed, and what what is it? After his resurrection, after he went to heaven, he's now revealed to John on the island of Patmos, and what is he doing? He is right in the middle of seven local churches. This is revealing something about Jesus He loves the local church. It is the very foundation of our Christian education. Every believer is to be planted in a local church. And and now, now, can there be ministries outside the church? Absolutely. But every one of them should be connected to the local church. If you look at all the great ministers in the world, Kenneth Copeland has a pastor. Keith Moore He pastors a church, but he still has a pastor. Your pastor has a pastor. You know, there's just, God does everything by delegated authority. It's really amazing. So he goes on to say, I know your works and your labor and your patience. I know your works, your labor, and your patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil, and you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So Jesus starts out with some positives here, and now he's saying, okay, but I have something against you. There's something that you're doing that you can't do anymore. Okay, so that's what he's saying. He's saying the the problem that you're having is you've left your first love. So let's go on here. He said, number five, remember therefore from where you're fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto you quickly and I will remove your candlestick out of his place except you repent. Repent. But this thou hast, or this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And then God says, which I also hate. And then at the end of this letter, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. 
So the letter to the church at Ephesus. So this letter, now remember, Ephesus, this, this letter was written to the biggest church. Some estimate close to 100,000 people could have been part of this church. And that's probably, I, I believe that's very accurate. Not only the biggest church, the greatest church. If you were going to launch your ministry, it would have to go through Ephesus. That you would have to be accepted there. So as we look at this, let's break this down a little bit. In verse 1 it says, And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, Angelos. It literally means a messenger. We know, and most theologians agree, this is talking about the pastor. As we've said before, I believe that uh, John used this word, which is what he heard from Jesus. I believe he used this to protect who the pastors were because they were under great persecution. And it says this, write these things. And to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand. This word hold, it literally means krateo. It, it means a masterful grip. It literally means with all your power to seize hold of something so that nothing could ever be taken out of your hand. It also means he, to seize hold of and have complete control over. So this is revealing something about Jesus. It means to hold fast, to lay hold of, to keep, to continue to hold, to completely take possession of. God is saying, Jesus is saying, I am he that holds what? The seven stars. We know that this is talking about the seven pastors of these churches. I hold them in my right hand, which is, which is literally indicative of the power of God. So, so this is a huge thing. I know this ministers to me. He holds, God's got a hold of me. He's got complete control of me. I need to, I need to walk in that so, that so that I could live long on the earth, right? You know, as a five-fold minister, it's real easy to die prematurely. All you got to do is just get out of faith. But no, Jesus has a hold of these seven pastors. And he's, he's also the one who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which last week we talked about that. That, that word candlesticks in the Greek, it's the word lampstands. And it, it's representative of those seven local churches. Jesus called the local church a lampstand. Okay? We are to bring light from below and dispel the darkness that is in this world. We're going to learn about a lampstand that the lampstands of that day were filled with olive oil, which is a type of the Holy Spirit. You can't, disp if you're a lampstand, it's impossible to dispense light without the Holy Spirit. That's why we preach, we preach the word of God. Yes, tongues is for today. Yes, all nine gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit are for today. Yeah, but pastor, that makes me uncomfortable. Well, then get over yourself because right. it's the Bible. Hello. The Holy Spirit, we can't, like, we can't see any of this without him. We can't, we can't literally reach anyone without him, right? So we're a lampstand. And what is Jesus doing? He is walking. He lit, that word is pateo in the Greek. He is walking as a lifestyle in the midst of every part of the local church. What am I saying? He is in your life. He's watching everything you do. And he takes this very, very seriously. Because it is serious. Man, there's multitudes dying out here. And they need, they need to not just hear about Jesus. No, they need to see him. Right? Right? So this is interesting here. When God has something to say, the angel, he wrote, notice he wrote this letter to the pastor of that church. When God has something to say to his church, he always goes through the designated chain of authority, right? The pastor 
This is what I'm to do. I'm to receive the message. I'm to eat it. I'm to digest it. I'm to, incorp- I'm to incorporate it in my life and you know, let it change and transform my life. And then I bring it and give it to you. See, we call that overflow. You'll know if, there, if, there's, if it's not fresh. Listen, if the word is not fresh, it's either that you're in a wrong place or I'm not in overflow, right? But I love that. I feel like I'm a human crock pot. I study the word, I digest it, I eat it, I, I just I simmer, it affects every area of my life. Sometimes, and most of the time, that's not comfortable because the word brings light on areas of your life and you're like, ugh, right. right? But then once, once I have revelation and at, at, what God, at God's appointed time, then that's all these messages on Sunday and on Wednesday for me, that's where they come from, you know? Uh, and that's, that's the way it's supposed to be. Jesus, he is seen in every letter doing what? He's commending and he's rebuking the pastor first and then the local church. My boss, the one I submit to, I can't fake out. He knows everything, everything I'm doing. Because and, and you'll see it. One day you guys are all going to be standing and you're going to see me, man, standing before the judgment seat of Christ and here it comes. The fire of God is going to go over everything I've ever done. And everything I didn't do in love or in faith is going to burn up. My prayer is that we don't see any flashes of light, you know, fire. I want to have eyebrows in eternity, right? I love Repentance. But you know, it's so easy when you love the Lord. It's just, it's, you know, it's like that song. You are good. I mean, you could say, I I think if we ever sang that for about 45 minutes, I don't know what would happen. We'd start getting a revelation of how good he was. It would just change our life forever. The church at Ephesus, see, Ephesus was a city. It was literally on a main road which connected the east from the west. It was a very beautiful city. It was a city that you would go to to go to college, go to school. For you ladies, it was a city that you would love to go to to shop. I mean, it was like the cool city. It was a cultural, it was literally the cultural center of Asia. Beautiful everywhere. It's like probably like, like South Orange County where, where, where we used to live. It's like fantasy land there. It's just Everything's trimmed, everything's perfect. It's, it's wild, but that would have been the way Ephesus was. This church was the, not, not only the biggest and greatest, it was a very spiritually mature church. Now remember that. It was a very spiritually mature church. Keep that right in your, in, in your mind as we're going through this letter. So, He's holding the seven stars. I want to just, just kind of focus in on this a little bit. In his right hand, these pastors were under incredible persecution. They were wondering even if they were going to live or make it. And it would have brought them great comfort to know John is telling his brothers. He probably had relationship with all of them. He's saying, guys, Jesus appeared to me, and you guys are being held in his mighty right hand. He's got a masterful grip on you. He's got control over you. So don't get out of faith. Don't lose heart. You're not going under. You're going over. See, here's the deal in your life. Satan tries to get you to play this game like you're trying to win. Can we just, let's just, you've already won. Right? We've already, we already got the trophy. We've won. We've won the universal championship. We are undefeated. So now don't give that up, right? Jesus is saying that he has a sovereign control over these ministry gifts. Now, another thing you see in here is that these pastors are accountable to Jesus for what they're saying and what they're doing. You know, you talk about, we, we talk, sometimes, you know, people say about pastors, well, you know, gosh, it's so hard because we live in this fishbowl before people. 
Who cares? That, that's nothing. We live under the divine microscope of God. <laughs> I mean, I could be walking around smiling, speaking life, and you guys will be going, man, pastor is just so happy. He is on fire. But Jesus sees everything. And he's up there going, man, you're pleasing me. You're, you're speaking the language of faith. When you walk by faith, you don't have to act like you feel. Right? See, that's such a secret. It's wonderful. He says here he's walking in the midst of seven local churches. This is how Jesus wanted to reveal himself. So let me ask you a question. Was he walking in the midst of the, the seven buildings that the churches met in? Are the churches, are the buildings the church? No. No. So Jesus, and, and this word walk, it's as a lifestyle. He's, so, so when you go home tonight, Jesus is going to walk around your house. He's always with you. He's always looking. He sees, he hears everything you say, sees everything you do. And this is what's really cool about him. When you say or do something that you shouldn't, if you'll, just, if you'll take the time and get quiet, you'll just sense this prompting down on the inside of you. Let go of the lower life. Embrace the life that I've given you. Come on, I'll, I'll help you. He's not like, man, I'm going to slap you. No, that's not him. He doesn't get down on you for messes you create. When you make a mistake, he's not interested in you wallowing in it. He wants, to, he wants you to turn from it and to walk with him. But he is always here. Every, everything, every activity that goes on in this church, he is passionate about. He knows, he knows the heart of everyone who's in helps ministry. He knows right where you're at tonight. And this is what he's always doing. He's always setting before you life and death. And he's always saying, choose life, choose life, choose life. And if you're choosing death, He's prompting you. He'll lead you to believers. He'll try to bring revelation from, to, from the word of God to your heart to get you out of where you're going. He's not the God that is, is stalking you and creeping you to look for things you're doing wrong. No, he's in your life everywhere you go to help you walk through life with days of heaven on the earth. He wants you to get everything. This is, see, we could stop here and go, man, the book of Revelation is awesome because this is Jesus. This is who he is. This is a revelation of him. You can't get that anywhere else. He's very clear. He's right in the midst. You know, we have many people in our church that are home tonight. Guess what? He's at their house and he's prompting them. He's trying to encourage them, to bring life to them. He's trying to prepare them for their day. He's trying to minister to them. He's always looking for a way in our lives to bring us Zoe life. Amen. He said, I, didn't he say in John, I am come. You should read that in the Greek. That's literally a continual presence thing. That means when he came to this earth, he came to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. And guess what? What is he doing tonight? He's trying to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. He's, he's, he's literally doing everything he can so that you could walk in this life that he's already given you. It's so, it's so real cool. It's really cool. So Jesus is walking around. He's encompassing. He knows inside and out every square inch of our church family. Do you know he knows every person everywhere that is to be part of our church family. What, what do we call those? The precious fruit of the earth. Oh, people are going to move here. You know why they're going to move here? They might think it's a job or think it's something else. No, they're going to move here. God will move here to place them here so that they can grow up. Right? Is it because no other church is, is good? No, no, no. He moves people everywhere. Many good churches. But it's, it's really wonderful what Jesus does. Jesus walks around and in the midst of the local church, he's examining, he's investigating what? 
He's investigating and examining our zeal, our love for him, our commitment to him. He's, he's, he's literally examining our activities, all of these things. This is what Jesus is doing. Knowing this, ministry becomes very serious because Jesus investigates his ministry gifts and, and, and what he says with his ministry gifts, the fivefold ministry, he examines them with his full authority. So these pastors, they're hearing that Jesus is in the midst. It brought them great comfort. You know, they get this letter from their spiritual father who had an open vision of Jesus, and he's right with them. Wow. It was also, see, it brought great comfort to John because now John, he was separated from these pastors that he loved. It brought great comfort to him that he was sitting here, although I'm on the island of Patmos, these friends of mine, these brothers, these fellow servants of mine, they're going to be okay. They're in Jesus' right hand. I love that. For us, you know, I pulled, you don't have to turn there because we'll keep going with this, but uh, Isaiah, for your notes, Isaiah 41.10 is a wonderful verse that you should always have on the, on the tip of your tongue. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, here we go again, for I am with you. See, he's right with you. You know, Tim, when, when Tim got diagnosed, Jesus was sitting there with him. Jesus has seen him through and guess what? Jesus will see him through. He'll never have to deal with that again. And everything that the enemy stole, he gets back with damages. And that's for Ann a lot. And boy, he, you know, he, 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 he's really good. He's, a, he's our advocate. He's the best attorney, man. He'll get it all back. Because guess what? The judge is his dad. Right, right? It's really cool. Fear not, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed. That means don't be bewildered. Don't be baffled. Don't be confused, for I am. That's the redemptive name. I am your God. You don't ever have to be confused again, because he's our God. I will strengthen you. Notice, you don't have to strengthen yourself. He's saying, I will strengthen you. That's why when you're weak, what does the Bible say for you to say? Let the weak say, I'm strong. Why? Well, who strengthens you? God. Man, when you're at your weakest point, you're technically at your strongest point. For, our, our, for his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Yes, or yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with, my right, with the right hand of my righteousness. So let's talk about just a little bit more these lampstands. First, they called them golden candlesticks in the Greek, golden lampstands. Lampstands are to be put in a high area to bring light to, into darkness. And light always dispels darkness. Notice these lights did not have to fight the darkness. The minute the light came on, the darkness was gone. That's the way it is with us. Well, that'll preach. You know, we're not just, we're just not fighting with the devil and, and hoping that, man, we're just going to finally overcome and win Omaha and the surrounding areas. Nope. No. Light dispels darkness. Lamp stands, though, as we said before, they're filled with olive oil. So the Holy Spirit... The Holy Spirit is everything. Without the oil, there is no light. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no revealing or revelation from the Word of God. He is the one that reveals everything. He reveals the Word of God to us. He reveals who He is. He reveals who we are in Him. He reveals our path. The Word of God is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. All of this... The church is a vessel of God's deity and glory in the earth. 
We are the vessels that literally carry God and the glory of God. And as, as, he, as he empowers us by grace, what comes out of us is glory. And the Bible says, it's, and it's another oracle of God, God says, as truly as I live, my glory will cover this earth like the waters cover the seas. And you and I are a part of it. The church is to be a living witness of the person of Jesus Christ to this dark world. Literally, we are to be a living expression of Jesus. In the same way that Jesus was a living expression of the Father, we are to be a living expression of Jesus. This is why the number one, command, number one commandment is this, that you love one another as I love you. So, so this is what we're to be. Guys, there are multitudes of the church. See, what you're going to see as you go through these seven letters is we are living in a time of great deception. People sit in churches offended. People sit in churches all just, just will not believe the word. They just, they just want to feel bad. We live, we, live, we live in a self-centered Christian environment, and I'm telling you, though, we're waking up. And as people wake up, they're going to help other people wake up. You fall in love with your brothers and sisters. There's so many people in the church. You know, I mean, I was this way for years. I mean, I thought, you know, God, yes, I'll serve you in ministry. Right here. It's got to be comfortable. It's got to be where. It's just got to be comfortable. And, and guess what? It's just not that way. It's, it's not comfortable to your flesh to follow the Lord. It's not comfortable to your flesh to walk in love. It's not comfortable to your flesh to walk by faith. But I'm telling you, here's the deal. Satan is very serious about stealing, killing, and destroying in your life. Very serious. God is very serious about you walking in utter victory and dominion over him. So what we have to do, though, is we have to make our own decisions. That's how come the church, what we do, we don't ever, we're, we're not, hey, you got to do this, you got to, no, no, this is, this is a God thing. He owns you if you're a Christian, but it's whosoever will let him come. Today you have a decision. Am I going to believe the word? Am I going to walk in love? Am I going to walk by faith? Am I going to be led by the Spirit of God? Or... Am I going to be led by my senses? Am I going to just live my own life? Right? And this is what we're seeing in these seven letters. You can never, ever, ever separate Jesus from his church. What I love about the gold part of this lampstand is gold in the Bible represents value, it represents deity, God, and it represents glory. I love that. Why, why a golden lampstand? Because Jesus, he places priceless value on the church. Why? Because he fills his church and he shows forth his glory through the church. I mean, it's amazing. Don't, don't ever speak bad about another church. Right? Don't ever, you know... Uh, if you ever find yourself where God's moving you from one church to another, first of all, very big decision in your life, make sure it's God and not you. But second of all, when you leave, leave in a manner that does not hurt that local church. Why are you leaving? Because the Lord's, the Lord's leading me to go. Yeah, but why? Well, because the Lord's leading me to go. Okay, yeah, I got that, but, but what happened? No, nothing happened. The Lord's leading me to go right? Usually by the second or third, what happened, people are like, well, you know, oh, the pastor's doing this or that. And, you know, and, and all of a sudden now when you're, you're hurting something that the head of the church values as priceless, right? I mean, you know, there's some denominations that believe some things that I sit here and go, okay, but you know what? If they're a lampstand, I'll guarantee you they are doing some things that we can learn from them. I think we could learn from each other. So verse 2, 
He says this, I know your works, your labor, and your patience. Jesus says, I know your works. The word know literally means I know firsthand because I've been there and I've seen it firsthand. Personal observation, personal inspection. I know your works because I've been there and I'm watching you do them. I know your labor, it's the Greek word kapas. It literally means to cut, it means toil, something that reduces strength. Jesus is saying, I know your works, ergon, your specific activities, but I also know your labor, toil. So as soon as you know that Greek word, you're going, uh-oh, wait a minute. We're Christians, we're not supposed to toil. This word means a cut. It means toil. It literally means something that reduces strength, something that produces weariness, it produces pain, and it produces trouble. It talks about the specific type of labor found only in your church. This is what Jesus is saying. He's going, I know this toil that you're, that you're working here at Ephesus. I know it. I've seen it, right? He, it's, it's literally, this Greek word denotes the hardest labor that produces complete exhaustion. And then he says this, and I know your patience, hupomene. I know your patience, your endurance. We'll talk a little bit more about that word. We'll go into it, but it means, I, Jesus is saying, I know your endurance. So I know what you're doing. I know you're doing some things that are, that are exhausting you and wiping you out. And I know, though, that you have patience. You're, you're enduring some things. So two out of the three are pretty good. And it says here, and I also know in how you cannot bear them which are evil, and you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and found them liars, and have borne and have patience, and for my name's sake have labored and have not fainted. So let me read you the Weiss translation of verse 2. It brings out the Greek wonderfully. It says, I know with absolute clearness your works your toil, your steadfast endurance, and fortitude under trial. So that's what Jesus is saying. See, Jesus knew all of these churches so well that he knew that by dealing with these seven, -ish, these seven churches, he was going to cover every problem that all the churches were facing. And I believe every problem that we'll ever face in the church. In 2 Timothy, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it to you. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. This is a letter that Paul wrote to a young pastor. He says, I charge, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. See, this word charge, it was a Greek technical word. It means I am summoning God's, now this is Paul talking to Timothy. Timothy, I am summoning God's full attention before you, right? In the sight of God and before the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, that means the living, and the dead at his appearing. This word Greek, this Greek word for appearing means his surprise appearing. His surprise appearing and his kingdom. So in this verse, if you were to read it literally, in, in modern English, it would read like this. I summon the full attention of God. His eyes are upon you. His gaze is fixed. He is watching you with intensity. Paul is telling Timothy that you better take your oath to the ministry and the call to the fivefold ministry very serious because when you least expect it, Jesus will come with the full authority and backing of his kingdom and examine you and judge you and investigate you. We think the IRS might be scary in an audit. That's the world I live in as a pastor. Get out of the word? Are you kidding me? No, 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 no. No, I, I, I don't want, you know, I don't want to be shown. I, I don't want him to show up 
and my life is just a mess, right? This is, this is huge. Jesus says, I know your labor. So this church, and church history tells us this, this church had a strong belief that they were to maintain doctrinal purity. I know that. This is God, the Lord talks to me all the time about this. We are to preach the word. Whether it's popular, whether it's not popular. Right? We are, we, so this church was like, we are going to maintain doctrinal purity. Their specific work, what they were doing, they were weeding out people who were calling themselves apostles. Right? They were, they were taking the time to look at what they're teaching and study this and look at their life and look at the fruit and doing all this stuff to make sure, are they right on or are they not? Because there were multitudes of ministers that were trying to make it in ministry so they would have a nice little slant. Well, I found this new doctrine that God has given me. Right? So that's still alive and well in the church. It's just, it's probably watered down a little bit more than at Ephesus. Many ministers with wrong motives, they would come up with doctrines that were wrong, but they were doing it to be noticed and accepted in their ministry. So they, they needed something new. Everybody wants something new. Pastors freak out because, gosh, if I'm not new and exciting, people will leave my church. So, you know, I just, I just taught on faith. You know, Lord, I know that you're wanting me to continue on, but I've been going for 14 weeks, and I can't, you know, and, and down the street, they're adding 100 people a month because they got cool videos, and they're, they're doing all this other really cool stuff. What are you looking at them for? Maybe that's what they're supposed to be doing, right? Jesus is like, no, no, no. You teach what I'm telling you to teach, that's what we do in the ministry. Jesus says, I know your patience. Patience, hupomene. Hupo, it means to be underneath a heavy, heavy load. And, and, and the rest of that word, or mone, it literally means, it's I have resolved myself that I will keep myself here. When you face anything in your life, a diagnosis, any circumstance, whatever you're going through right now, you have to know that you have to resolve that I am going to stay right here. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm moved only by the word of God, and I'm not moving, and this thing will crumble before me. It will bow to the name of Jesus. It will, whatever this is, looks like in my life right now, it's going to change, and I'm not moving until it does. We receive all the promises of God through faith and patience, right? And here's the cool thing. Patience is a fruit of your spirit. It literally, I, I, James says a lot about it. It talks about it. Now, this is interesting. This is the same word. Patience right here in John 15, 7. Know that scripture that we always quote? If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you'll ask whatever you will and it'll be done. You know what that word abide is? Hupomene. If you will resolve that I am not moving, I'm going to stay under this load of whatever I'm facing. If you resolve to do that, you'll ask whatever you will and it, it, will, it will be done to you. Praise God, Tony, man. Pastor, that's, that's the message. You just told me I have victory. Yes. This is why we need each other, guys. Because when you're alone, you know, when you're at home, when you're alone, when, when all hell's breaking loose and you get that text from somebody, a brother or a sister of yours with a scripture saying, praying for you. You're a man of God. You're a woman of God. You're going over and not under. He's greater. He's your strength. Whatever it is, we need each other. First, centuries, first century believers, this is the early church, first century believers all desired to live in this position for God. 
We've lost this in the church right now. You know what it is? I will not be moved. That was a, that was, now they didn't know a lot. They didn't have a hundredth of the revelation we have. But they knew they had the name of Jesus and they had this resolve, I will not be moved. I love, I love uh, Pastor Hagen at Ramah. I cannot be de- defeated, and I will never quit. Right? When his dad died, and he has a worldwide ministry with a worldwide budget, and when his dad died, instantly a third of all of their giving left. He said one day he walked out of his office, and he, and he literally he walked out in the parking lot, and he just stopped. And he dropped his Bible on the ground and stepped on it and said, I will not be moved. This ministry will not go under. Its greatest days are ahead. God is faithful and I, and I will not quit. See, if, if you don't do that, you will quit. You'll quit. But there's a strength in you not to quit. And he is called the mighty Holy Spirit. He's called Jesus. He's called God the Father. James 1.4 says this, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. See, why her? Let patience have her perfect work. Well, James penned this. Pastor of the church in Jerusalem a a, a predominantly Jewish church. The early church called patience the mother of all virtues. That's why he said her. I mean, it's just, it's powerful. So verse four, nevertheless, now, now here we go, nevertheless, I have something against you. This is the Greek word echo. It literally means Jesus is saying, I have an intensely personal feeling I, it, it's possessing me. I am filled with this. Jesus is saying, I am filled with this. I have something against you. What is it? Because you have left your first love. Now, this word left, here's the deal. It literally, this Greek word means to depart so slowly that you don't even realize you're departing. Now, guys, this is where the majority of the church is right now. We have slowly and progressively departed from the Lord, and we don't even know. People don't even know. No, I'm a strong Christian. I go to church, right? Now, I never read my Bible. No, no, see, see what, what's ha- going to happen, and you're seeing it, we're seeing it already. There is going to be an awakening and a revival to where it, it, every time somebody gets serious about God, it helps their brothers and sisters. I don't want my brothers and sisters in the Lord to suffer death because they've so slowly departed away from the Lord that now it's, you know, it's okay to go to a bar. It's okay to have some drinks with friends and maybe, you know, whatever. It's okay to sleep around, on, you know, because, but, and then I go to church and I hear a nice sermon and, and I feel good about myself. It's, it's just okay. While what you don't realize is your brothers and your, your, the people in your life that don't know God are going, there's no difference. Zero difference, right? Now, now I'd almost rather have that than have somebody walk around thumping people with the Bible. Usually the people that are thumping people to the Bible, you better leave ho- live holy or else, they're the ones that have all the skeletons in their closet that they're not dealing with, right? But, but what I'm talking about is genuine here. Jesus is saying to the greatest church, a spiritually mature church, he's saying, I am filled with this. It, it, it concerns me every moment of my life. You have slowly departed from me, your first love. Isn't that interesting? See, Jesus, revelation of Jesus, he is very concerned. He, he, see, if you depart from him, 
If you've left your first love, it's because you have literally left walking in a revelation of his love for you. Jesus wants you, right? He just loves you. And, this, and when he says your first love, that in the Greek it means your early love. He's talking about you have lost the wonder when you first got saved. That's what he's saying. Yeah, I mean, you're working really hard, you're doing some good things, but, you, but you're getting into toil, and because you're getting, you're so focused on keeping these, these faulty ministers out that you're losing your first love. There's a principle there. Pastor, you are, you're so concerned about your life and, and, and you're so concerned that your church might be sliding back or this is happening and that's happening that you're so concerned that now you've departed and you forgot about the most important thing in your life, your early love, the wonder of just being saved. See, all of us need to stay in this position. This church forgot that which is most important to Jesus, the maintenance of early love. I'm telling you, I was four and a half when I accepted the Lord. I can't hardly talk about it anymore because I think about it. And I mean, I, I literally, I didn't even really know what I was doing. I was four and a half years old. We went to church. I saw and it probably was a Betty Lucan thing, you know, the little, what was that little, the felt pad thing, story about Jesus. And I came home and, you know, my mom and I were living in a two-bedroom apartment underneath her parents. There was a flat in Chicago. And I walked in our little kitchen. My mom was sitting at the table and I said, Mom, I want to accept Jesus. That means a million times more to me. I don't know about you, when I got up today, I'm like, oh, Lord. I mean, I'm 55 years old. I know people that are 55 and older that don't know the Lord and that have no desire for him. And I just sit here and go, oh my gosh, Father, I'm so thankful. I remember, I, you, you love me, you sent your son, the early love. We must never lose the wonder. Jesus wants us to do the work of the ministry and to maintain our love walk with him. Those are the two things. Verse 5, remember therefore from whence you were fallen. So Jesus is giving them the answer to this now. Now this is what I want you to do. I, I'm passionate. I'm filled with this. You've left your first love. So now this is what I want you to do, church at Ephesus. Remember therefore from whence you were fallen. Ek pipto. From whence you had a complete downfall. When you leave your first love, Jesus calls it complete downfall. Yeah, but I'm doing a lot. No, 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 forget all that. It literally means to be driven off course. I wonder who drives us off course, right? He says, number one, re remember, remember from where you were fallen and repent. Metanoia, repent. It's a change of mind. It's not a feeling. It's a decision. Not a matter of emotions. Repentance is not remorse. It's literally just, I'm changing my mind. So if that's where you are tonight, you remember where you were fallen. You're like, yep, you know what? I, I just got too busy. I've let life get me down. I've let all this stuff. I'm repenting. I'm changing my mind. I don't have to cry. I don't have, no, I might not feel anything. Don't worry about that. I'm just making a decision. I am turning and walking another way. He says here, it, it literally means a metanoia. It's, it's not a matter of emotions. And he says, and do the first works. That word do is poio. It literally means do. It, it, it's where they get their word poet from. It literally means a creative flair. Jesus is saying, do something so that you set your decision in motion. See, if you ever repent of anything, see, some people think, oh, it's real repentance if I'm crying and I'm losing it. No, many times that's remorse. That's not repentance. Darn it, I, can't, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I, I you know, 
It's remorse, and there's usually no power to change in it. But if you repent and you go, nope, this is what I've been doing, I'm changing. I'm not gonna be beaten up with guilt and shame and condemnation. I'm making a decision. And then, and now, and it says, and now do something to solidify that decision. So what, what is it? I don't know, the Holy Spirit will tell you. I'm gonna get up, and the first thing I'm gonna do when I get out of bed, I am gonna have a time with the Lord. I'm gonna read my chapter. Y'all, did y'all read Mark chapter five today? That's where we are, right? I'm gonna read my chapter, and I'm gonna pray, and I'm gonna put God first in my life. I don't know what the decision is, but you just make some decision to do something to solidify that repentance. Jesus is telling these people how to maintain their early love. He says, remember. He goes on to say, remember the first works. This word was used to describe a tomb, a grave, a sepulcher. This word means a statue or a monument. This church was so busy, so cluttered by activity, that their, uh, their, their, literally their early love was covered like a grave is covered. It was just covered up with works. Works, 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 works. They were working so hard, they lost their first love. They covered it up. Jesus is telling them to make a, fo- a focused effort. Remember, dig up that grave. Dig it up. Get it out. Bring it out in the open. Get a, do a focused effort, dig up your early love and put a statue of it in your life. What, what could that be? That could literally be your Bible. Hopefully you have a Bible and I would say, man, you write right in the front of that thing, this day I repented, this day I drew a line in the sand, I'm never gonna be moved by what I see anymore, I'm only gonna be moved by the word of God, my love for him will always be first. Remember from where you were fallen. This word fallen, again, a complete downfall because you were driven off course. See, God sees things totally differently than man. Man would look at this church of Ephesus and think it's the greatest church on the planet. God is saying they are a complete downfall because they've been driven off course. I mean, it's, it's that's, see, we can't fake this stuff. When early love is absent in a believer's life, it is a complete downfall. And I'm telling you, there is power. There is power available to you to remember your early love. Wow. I'm going to wait to deal with verse 6 uh, until next week when we go through the church of Smyrna because I want, to, I, want to de- I want to get you out of here early on these Wednesday nights. Um, and this is such a serious subject. So we're going to stop at verse 5 tonight. And then we'll pick it up here next week. And then we'll go through Smyrna and hopefully some of the other ones. It's hilarious that the smallest church got the longest letter. It's hilarious. But I want you to, if you leave with nothing else tonight, there is power for you to repent. There's power for you to remember your early love. So I would encourage you, take this. And this is the way the whole book of Revelation is going to be. As we learn about things, it's going to reveal Jesus to you, and it's going to reveal some things so that you can really grow in him. Amen? Amen. Sure love you. Let me pray for you.